Conventional Soldier, a military podcast brought to you by two British Army veterans in association with ISAR.com. Welcome, everyone, and thanks again for downloading another episode of the podcast. Our guest today is Barry Rice, a former soldier, a security contractor, and now an author. Barry joined the New Zealand Infantry in 1985, aged 22, where he spent three years before passing selection for the New Zealand SAS. He went on to serve seven years with that unit, specialising in one of the squadron's boat troops. On this episode, we're going to discuss his military career, time as a security contractor in Iraq with Blackwater Commercial, a subsidy of the US private security company Blackwater that he helped set up. So Barry... Thank you for coming on the podcast. And can you start by telling us why you joined the army and an overview of your service career? Uh, certainly, and uh, thank you, Kevin and Conan, for for having me. I joined the New Zealand Army back in eighty five, basically as a means to leave the country. It was pretty difficult to leave New Zealand back then. Yeah, you had to either have a lot of money, and a real far off overseas country was something like the UK. Or you could go to Australia, and then that didn't really appeal to me. So I joined. I joined the military to, to be able to leave New Zealand, which I was able to do. Secondarily, I joined with the intention of joining the SAS. That was my underlying motivation. So those are my reasons. I mean, back in the eighties, we'd only just really found out about the British SAS through the Iranian embassy siege. So with the New Zealand SAS, is that sort of ingrained in the? in the country that people knew quite a lot about it? Well, we did as far as Vietnam uh, goes, and there was, and also the region that I come from in New Zealand, there was a sort of a lot of people joined the military for the same reasons I wanted to. And for some reason, we, we tended to have a very high pass uh, rate of the selection to join the SES, so we did know about it. But again, you're right. I mean, after the Princess Gate, yeah, everybody wanted to join, you know, for that reason as well. And for listeners that might not know, and Barry was alluding to there, he's got a Maori heritage. From what you're inferring there, Barry, does a lot of Maoris join the army? To... Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very high percentage. Yeah. We tend to want to go there. Just it's, it's, it's what we're attracted to. When you uh, decided to leave the army, what was drove that decision? And what work did you do prior to your first role in Iraq as a security contractor in 2003? Well, I, d- I decided to leave after doing 10 years in the military and uh, particularly after doing seven years in the unit, your body gets beaten up quite quite badly and I was starting to limp. My my hips were sore, I dislocated shoulders. I mean, anyone who's been a, a soldier or a squaddy knows the feeling and I still had, I'd, I'd signed up for a 20-year contract, I had 10 years to go and I was still young and I was going, oh yeah, by the time I'm 42 when I get out or 43, I'm going to be a broken, twisted old man So and still too young to retire. So I decided to get out. Um, and also, you know, part of this, the decision was I couldn't see where the New Zealand government was going to use us, uh, was going to deploy us. I mean, we were missing out on a lot of the activities that were going on purely because of our geography and that we had a succession of Labour governments who were too busy trying to, you know, be peaceful to everybody. And um, there was nothing happening in our neck of the woods. So I, I made, the, made the choice I was going to get out, and I did. And I was lucky enough to quite quickly get a job uh, providing security in uh, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, uh, and that's where it, it started. And I did a lot of training contracts in Hong Kong again, um, Philippines. And that's when I got the opportunity when I was working in the Philippines uh, to sign up to well, to be a contractor in Iraq in 2003. The terms PSC or private security contractor or company and private merger company, there seems to be no legal difference by convention and the two are often seen as uh, synonymous. In simple terms, they do differentiate on the premises that PMCs or private security companies mainly focus on the provision of security for people and assets from criminal activity, while PMCs, private merger companies, tend to more focus on the military aspect, military training, support, mentoring, escorting. What is apparently that the difference on operations is not always clear, and I think we found that, I mean, because Colin and I were in Iraq in the early days as well, both serving in the military, so we did see a huge influx of um, 
varying types of security standards and uh, competencies, should I say. Some were ex-military, some were ex-police, and some were ex with no real security background at Cooks all. and bushel waters. In some companies. Contractors on operations are not a new thing. We've got some figures from the, the Department of Defence, the US Department of Defence. And during World War One, and, and contractor doesn't necessarily mean private military security, it could be a defence contractor, someone who's in the defence chain, but not necessarily a military person. So in World War One, there was one contractor for every 24 military personnel. In Vietnam, there was one contractor for every five military personnel. In Gulf War One, and this one surprised me, there was one contractor for every hundred military. And post 9-11, it was one for one. One contractor, one military person as we moved to enduring operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. So obviously, short-term operations, the military just take the lead, get on with it. And it's a very small logistics tail and defence contractors supporting. But obviously, post 9-11, Iraq at the beginning and then Afghanistan, the private military companies, the private security companies obviously grew. The contracts are huge as we did the enduring operations and the military and the governments were looking at how to supplement their forces. You know, some of the roles, some mundane roles and some actually quite sporty roles. Yeah, and it's interesting as well, in that same study, they're saying that half the Pentagon budget goes on private contract, and so it's very lucrative. And as we're talking to Barry as we go along, you'll see that a lot of that money that goes to these companies doesn't necessarily go to supporting and equipping the lads on the ground, and that is no. something that Barry brought out clearly in his book, and we'll discuss about it in a minute. With the onset of activities in Afghanistan and Iraq during the early 2000s, there was a huge amount of these companies, set up initially mainly by ex-special forces, backed by entrepreneurs trying to get in the financial market that was burgeoning with considerable international and specifically United States funding. As already discussed, during the onset of the Iraqi operation, there was estimated to be some 100,000 private military contractors working directly for the US Department of Defence. Uh, a number of serious incidents involving several companies led to serious calls for regulation of the industry, and well-known incidents like the killing of Blackwater contractors in Fallujah, the trophy video set to Elvis Presley music of a private security co- uh, detachment shooting at civilians in Iraq, and the Nisar Square incident in 2007 involving Blackwater, all contributed to changes in the industry and more stringent regulation. So in the initial stages, there's a proliferation of PSCs and PMCs that are intent on making money in a target-rich environment for contracts. Some of these are well-established, reasonably sized entities adding security in a hostile environment to their portfolio, whilst others are small niche businesses already in existence in what's called the circuit. And back in the day, the circuit primarily used to be very select. It involved a lot of ex-special forces type guys, parachute regiment, Royal Marines, that type of person. Uh, So they all jumped in, trying to take advantage of the opportunity, and a lot of others were just blatant new arrivals jumping in the bandwagon. Yeah, indeed. So it was your background that you deployed to Iraq in uh, 2003 to work as a security contractor for a company called Custer Battles. So what made you go there? What was your initial period like and what was your initial thoughts? What made me go there was because it was the opportunity that had come along and just sort of going back a little bit to the circuit. That was predominantly tied up by the UK forces. I mean, coming from New Zealand, it was very difficult to crack that nut and get in. Unless, of course, you were, you were from the unit and you knew somebody, and predominantly was, it was in Africa, Rhodesia, and, and places like that, a little bit before my time. So um, it was kind of like a, a new opportunity of the circuit, but for those of us who weren't around back in those days and, and those of us who were part of the, the, the British you know, military forces, that it gave us an opportunity to get over there. Um, I, I sent my CV into Custer Battles and was accepted rather quickly because of, I believe, my background um, spoke for itself. Also, it was a foot in the door. I wasn't earning anything like good money when I got out of the military. You know, it's sort of, I'd done these different jobs around the place and I'd come back to New Zealand and I'd been in the Philippines, but it was still working very hard for crappy money. And um, their daily was 200 US a day. Now, when you're, you know, and anyone knows who's been in, in, in the military, it's very hard to make a decent living and feel like you're providing, you know, in, in Civvy Street. You just don't feel fulfilled. $200 a day is a lot of money when you're earning hardly anything like that. So I, I took that as an opportunity 
when I first got there, I was initially, you know, I was the only not American, and we all met up in Amman, Jordan. And um, so I just thought everyone would have the same, basically the same kind of uh, background that I did, which I soon found out wasn't necessarily so. Then we, we got into Baghdad, and it was a real hodgepodge, mitchmats of, uh, of people coming from police departments, uh, army, sort of different, all over the place. The other companies who were already there and did tend to have a very good high standard that I saw was Blackwater. Uh, I didn't really know them back then, but they were doing the State Department contract. Another company called Triple Canopy, predominantly um, Delta Force. And I think not too long after Pilgrims, uh, when they started up, they were a very good UK company. So it didn't take me long to realize that Custer Battles was, okay, they got me over. I'm very grateful for that. But their commitment to us certainly wasn't what I was expecting, you know. And, and, and coming from a, a military background, you know you never get your hopes up too high. Make your most of, of what they give you and just make it work. And it just seemed to be like, well, this is a little bit less than what I would have expected from being in a conflict zone. Yeah, because you write, you write in your book that you had to source your own weapons and, and stuff like that. So I think, you know, you I don't know, you might expect to turn up and there'd be a, a CQMS stores there and there's your weapon and there's your all. None of that was there for you. You're pretty much self-sourcing from what I can gather about. Is that yeah, true? that's true. I mean, uh, that, that is what you expect. You know, you think that they've been there, they're, they're making money, they're, that's what you'd expect. But, I mean, we even did that when we formed Blackwater Commercial, even more so. Custer Battles, they did have, you know, weapons for us, AKs, which were, good. Don't know, don't know where they dug them up from. I had one explode in my hands. No body armor, uh, soft skin vehicles, but then again, there was no sort of hard vehicles. But we had the same, when we, when we did form Blackwater Commercial, we, we were at the car park at nighttime buying buying guns out of the, the trunk of a taxi. So we started off exactly the same way, if not a little bit less, but we had to prove ourselves before Moyok and, and the US would, would give us the green light to go ahead and pump some money into us, and uh, that's what we were willing to do, and we, and we did it. So how did you end up working for Blackwater then? Did you get poached or did you approach them? No, there was a guy in Custer Battles who was uh, former SEAL Team 6 back in the day. But I didn't know him. So all the other guys were feeling just as sort of duped about Custer Battles as I was that this wasn't really working out for us. So uh, this guy contacted uh, Moyok, where the headquarters of uh, Blackwater was, said there's a, many opportunities here for the rebuilding. Blackwater at that time were predominantly doing the State Department contracts, so you had to have state clearances in order to do their, their work. So it was American contract or American personnel only. D said, well, you know, there's a great opportunity here. We can form a, a Blackwater commercial site and do some of the rebuilding contracts that are coming up. And uh, so Moyok agreed, said it was a it was a good idea, but you're, you're on your own until you can prove yourself. Some of the guys that I'd met they went and had meetings with this individual, and I said, well, can I have a meeting with him? So uh, I said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problems. And, um, you know, that was my, my group of guys because, you know, the four amigos. And uh, so I went up there and I confidently um, stated my case. Now, knowing my background would speak for itself as far as at least having him uh, listen to me. And then while I was at it, I, I thought I'd see how far I could sort of go with this. And um, I said, well, you know, thank you for accepting me, and I love the fact that I'm now going to be making three times the amount of money if this succeeds, but I'd like to also be the team leader, or in American terms, the C1, Command 1. I'm the only Tier 1 operator here, and as you are, uh, so we're the only Tier 1 operators here that I, can, that I can see, so if anyone's going to be making decisions on my life, I think I'm a little bit more qualified to do those than other guys who are perhaps Army, police, or or something else and, and he agreed so we packed our gear one night drove off into the darkness and then no idea what we were going to do or we had an idea how we were going to do it. we had no money just a whole lot of hope and uh and away we went this initial period did you have any foreboding that you're getting in above your head you talk about the quality of the people and the sort of those initial disappointments that led you to push to form blackwater commercial but were it, did you have any sort of worries at this point that or do you think no i'm I'm well trained enough to cope with what's been thrown at me. No, actually, I was. I had that exact feeling. I was well trained enough to be able to handle this. I'm in charge. I'm used to 
being in charge. I believe with my leadership skills were were good enough um, because of the unit it t- teaches you that. So I was able to to be a, a very efficient, I think, team leader. And I I always lead by example. You know, if anyone's going to do it, I'll do it first. Between this individual and myself, we uh, we cracked on. He trusted me to do certain jobs, and I was grateful that he that he chose me to do these. You know, running around the country with my with my team, and uh, we succeeded. And believe me, we had some very difficult drives from, you know, Baghdad to Bajor on uh, nothing but a hope of prayer. And, and as I say in the, in the book, a tea towel. Yeah, can you just explain that, Barry? Because that was a, a jaw dropper for me in a red that. <laughs> we drove down to, uh, to Bajor from Baghdad, and, uh, which was easy. You just follow Tampa. You just go all the way down and then you, you cut left. So we ended up in Bajor and uh, we got stayed the night there and then drive back up to Baghdad the next day. But the next day... The road was closed due to a, an IED, or sorry, the day after, because we spent a day doing recons. So we weren't too sure what to do. And uh, I'd heard about, you can go up through Nazareth. I'd seen it on a map. And anyone, again, being in the military, they know if you can't get a map of it, you basically take a, a photograph with your mind and you try and memorize as much as you can with it. And then uh, one of the guys in my team, while I was sort of like kicking myself for uh, trying to make a decision on what to do, he pulled out a tourist tea towel and i'm talking about like <laughs> this thing was from the 1970s and it was a, a, a tea towel with the map of iraq screen printed on it with around the edges the tourist attractions and in the middle was the basic roads that led around to the different areas and um you know they still were there so i thought you know i can make this work i, I trust myself i have to make this work um and we were driving a uh, soft skin chevy suburban and they have a very rudimentary north, south, east, west compass in the rear vision mirror. So I had a tea towel on my lap. I had my watch for uh, time and distance and the rudimentary compass and away we went. And uh, using just this tea towel, hell of a lot of quiet prayers and some and some, <laughs> some fluffing of the pants, we, we uh, <laughs> BS my way back to Baghdad and we got back just after last night, you know, and, uh, and it worked. Improvise, adapt, overcome it is best. You have part. to do it. Yeah. So a tea towel, yeah. a tea towel is better than a silk escape map. Well, <laughs> it's just a bit less quality. <laughs> I think that was better than the GPS. That was amazing. Yeah, I remember in uh, Iraq in '91, we were out in Granby that we, we we advanced so quickly that we ran out of maps, and because of the desert, we just turned the maps over and just drew, drew fresh grid lines and continued yeah. on the grid lines because that's that's all you needed to do. But yeah. I got to admit, mate, I admired your bollocks when I was reading about that tea towel <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now it was a lifesaver. So your book opens up with the 2004 Fallujah incident where four American contractors were killed. For those that may not know, can you explain what the incident was, the impact it had on the, the private security companies and the PMCs, and what this meant for the insurgency or the turn of the insurgency? Yeah, sure, no problem. That, um, that incident is perhaps the one incident that changed everything for everybody in Iraq, I think. Before, it was kind of, we'll drive by down the roads, we'll look at you with a snarl and you look at us with a snarl. You know, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. But that incident completely changed everything. Um, you know, the night before, I was having a, a whiskey with a new guy I'd just met who was new to the company. Um, he was from Hawaii, so him and I were stayed. We were talking about our, our sort of very similar cultures and, and got on really well. And then the next day, off, off they went. And then uh, due to the fact that you know, getting back to the equipment, I suppose, we didn't have long-range long, long range comms. We had comms, we could talk to each other vehicle to vehicle, providing it was, say, within 500 metres to two kilometres on in a straight line. But the one thing we didn't have were long-range comms. We had no comms with them. The Iraq service was, you know, didn't really work that well. The uh, Thoraya satellite system was, you know, hit or miss. And then uh, two days later, our housekeeper... I was uh, I was at my desk in, in the team house, and she let out this almighty scream, and screamed out my name actually, and I came running into the into the TV room where she was, and she was in hysterics, looking at the TV. There was the sight of you know, vehicle burning and, and and crowd going crazy, throwing rocks at at a bird corpse in the in the vehicle, and I and I got a sort of a gut feeling that I knew the outline of that vehicle, and I knew that's them, that's our guys. And uh, then the, the camera ran up to the second vehicle 
one of the boys was outside the vehicle, his arms all bent up in that familiar burnt position. The front rocks had him in it for, oh yeah, I recognise the colour of the trim. That was definitely our vehicles and they were they were definitely our guys. And by that time, other people had joined us in the uh, in the TV room. And uh, it, it kind of hit home. And particularly for me, it was like, I, I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I, I really thought to myself, okay, okay now, now we know the rules. There are no rules. Okay, you've done this to us. You, you've got to expect us to do this to you. We won't be smiling anymore. We won't be waving anymore. You know, you're, you're, you've got a gun, all right? We think you're going to point it towards us. We're going to get you before you get us. Yeah, and we're not going to muck around. To a degree, that's how we in Blackwater rolled a lot. Uh, and a lot of people didn't like that, but screw them. You did once, but you did for a long time. So yeah, that changed everything for everybody. Now, what it also did for the for the insurgency was it emboldened them and it made them very confident. It was a great success for them. You know, another thing you sort of got to be aware of that we never trusted the IPs, the, the Iraqi police, because they were working both sides. They were kind of led down that road into Fallujah. You know, but a, a little bit, and I mentioned this in the book. There was that that team leader at the time, or the team leader for those guys, was someone who I had worked with extensively, just him and I, two-man close protection in Kabbalah, which is very dangerous. I came away from there going, this guy should never lead a team. You know, some guys can be special forces, but it doesn't mean that they're leaders. You know, I mean, every unit's had guys where there's been a very stringent selection process and you're going to have, how did he pass? It happens in every job. And this particular guy was kind of like that for me. He was, he, he had, he didn't blend in. He just wasn't the gray man. And he did lead his team, and unfortunately, his overconfidence, I believe, led them down to where anyone would have had a bit of caution and said, you know what, my gut's telling me not to do this, and I'm going to follow my gut. His gut would have told him not to do this, but he would have done it anyway. So yeah, it really changed everything for us, particularly in Blackwater, and I think for a lot of security companies as well. And it really did put us on the map, and then after that, everything that happened was Blackwater, Blackwater. Read your book. Well, I'll recap a little bit. So that, that incident showed you the violence of what could happen to you if you get it wrong. Yeah. Put on top of that, there is no medivac. There's very rarely a QRF that you can get in touch with. Comms Apache, as in, you know, you can be in dead spots and all the rest of it. What surprised me reading your book, though, was that despite people knowing that, despite some of them having SEAL backgrounds and other sort of tiered operators' backgrounds, there was a complacency that by them that your team didn't have because in your book you're describing about how you drilled your guys, you went to the ranges every Friday, you took it 100% serious. Why do you think these guys, was it just underestimating the enemy or they did, uh, they just think this will never happen to me because of what I did in the past? You know, I think there was a lot of underestimation of what was going on outside the wars or your particular safe spot and an overestimation of people's abilities. You know, we, we trained, and, and we're civilians, but we're not civilians. I mean, you, it's a military organization. However, we I gave SMEAC orders, which is the way you give orders in the military, so you know exactly what to cover on, on whenever you go out of the, the safety of the wars until you keep, get back in. A lot of guys didn't do that in, in other teams. They used to be in the different SEAL teams or the different rages and all those sort of carry on. You know, they lived off that reputation to a degree. You know, not all of them, some of them. And it became a bit of the, I'm going to wear a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops and walk around the pool and then uh, get on out on a run and I'll see you in, you know, two hours for a bit. You know, and it, be, it kind of became a little bit complacent. I never did that for my guys. I briefed all the time, you know, before we went on any run, no matter how mundane and no matter how many times we did it in a day, we did a brief and then I'd debrief afterwards. It wasn't anything too formal. It would be around the what of the vehicle. You did this, you did this, you did this. We could do this better. or well, that was great. Okay. Fridays, because it was basically the clients never worked on a Friday as, you know, Muslim day off. We practiced in the morning. We drilled. We went to the range. We went to the cross swords. We did contact drills. We did evacuation drills. We did whatever we could until I was happy. And it was all done until I was happy. And um, I, I was there doing it as well. And I was also taking points from my guys. You know, I wasn't the be on end or I know it all because I didn't. Uh, obviously, when I rolled the uh, the vehicle, that sort of... Uh, yeah, you're not getting away without explaining <laughs> that one, Barry. Yeah. 
you, you, you're gonna have to come out and cough to this one. Yeah, well, okay. So when we finally got hard skin vehicles, they got they got to see listen. I have no clue what sort of flatbed trucks they are. Uh, listen, little little tiny things, and they'd up armored. They'd armored them. Now these things are very tight, without armor. So you measure the armor inside them, which makes them even smaller. Whilst wearing armor, weapons, slings, rhodesians, carrying guns, and then trying to squeeze in them. And a lot of these things are very high off the ground. They got a very high center of gravity, right? So we were training, doing contract drills with them in the uh, cross swords. And there's these two, you know, <laughs> little devils got on my shoulder. And one of them said, you think you could do a JT in one of those things? Yeah. <laughs> 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 the other one said, no, nah, don't do it. No, do it. And uh, the other one said, go on, you can do it. You can do it. So like a, like a, like a dumb A, I jumped in <laughs> and one of the boys Said, oh, I want to jump on the back. And I said, no, 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 best bet you don't. Put it in reverse. I come screaming backwards, spun the wheel around, and then just watched everything go from looking the right way up, looking to sideways, to looking upside down, to looking back on the side. And then I was like, oh, and you know when you're going to go over as soon as it happens. And it was just, and the worst thing about it was not only had I rolled it, and it was so being brand new, but it was also right in front of the U.S. military as well, who were, ta- who were taking photos <laughs> of dumbass contractors, you know, rolling quite expensive. Reckon the police. The face, yeah. So I, I coughed up to it. I admitted it. That vehicle became the most stripped vehicle in Baghdad and Blackwater for quite some time. Because a lot of the vehicles you were using before that, that you were improvising your own armor, weren't you? You were making plates to hang off the windows and, and things like that. Well, after that, we actually, we did. After we, uh, I rolled that truck, we got two um, Chevy Suburbans and we put 10 mil plates on the inside by hanging them over the doors. We had two guys, two guys on my team, um, they were very good at welding and, and construction. It was kind of like a little montage of um, the A-team, you know, out went to sort of like decent vehicles and came back these battle trucks. They were actually extraordinarily good. Apart from the fact that the windows were down all the time, but it didn't really rain, so that was the problem. The, the the metal got extremely hot in the summer, but you could fire if you had to out of the windows, but you can't do that in, in an armoured vehicle. They were very big, and they were also very powerful. Uh, again, what these, these Nissans were not. They weren't big or powerful. So we were kind of, we benefited from my mistake. So really, was it really a mistake, me rolling that vehicle? Instead of, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, those those two became our really solid workhorses, and um, yeah, they saved us a couple of times actually. Those ten mil plates. For people that aren't familiar with operations over there from private security companies, I mean, you do make it clear in your book that there's a way up between a low profile and a high profile vehicle. And yes, these armored vehicles would give you plenty of protection, but they'd also draw a lot of attention to you because mm-hmm. they're very conspicuous out in uh, Iraq. Yeah. So, did you match the vehicles to task or? Just what was ever serviceable at the time? Those were our two vehicles, um, and, and for our particular client. Now, if we were doing something that was a little bit more further out with another group, let's say I was asked to help somebody else, and they had um, Suburbans, or not, sorry, Suburban sedans, like BMWs and whatever, then we, we would they would use those, and we would still use our up-armored Chevys, but we would be a little bit more separate from them, so not to attract attention. The only trouble was, yeah. back in the day, most of the armoured sedans that came over were, were black BMWs and Mercedes. And the insurgents were also driving around in black BMWs and Mercedes and, uh, and, and little white sedans. They also become targets not just from like, the insurgency, you might have thought, okay, it's one of our guys, but big military, big army didn't particularly know who they were, so they were targets for them. And uh, they were even sometimes more dangerous than, than the insurgency. Yeah, approaching the back end of an American convoy was, uh, you write clearly in your book, there's a, a backside twitching couple of moments when you were doing oh, that. For sure, for sure. And that's, that's always a losing battle. I thought I the private security was struggling with equipment. I mean, when I was out there at the same sort of time, 2003, 2004, we had no armoured vehicles. I had a Land Rover, soft skin, no armour at all. The only armour was what we yeah. wore. And that was it for 10 months and we could not get armour. And we couldn't up armor either. We had nothing to up armor with, and we were no, I, I, going everywhere. I, I remember watching um, people in in Humvees and they're putting layers of sand. Uh, yeah, layers mm. just to try and slow the bullet down. No one could keep up with the demand as the insurgency increased quite rapidly. We just didn't have the for the military the green fleets 
to support troops on the ground. Well, Bar- Barry's alluded to it about contractors going out there and underestimating the enemy. We did it as well. well yeah, not yeah. We, we, we just didn't have... People in charge, they never thought that insurgency would get as no. quick and as powerful as no. it did. And the armour we had was obviously trap vehicles, but what we needed was those light vehicles, so the small streams that provided some, some protection for the crews on board, but we had absolutely nothing. Yeah. And Barry talks about it in his book about the the uh, EFPs, uh, yeah. explosive yeah. form projectiles. Yeah. They were coming across the border from Iran, I believe. That's right. As the insurgency developed and foreign fighters flooded into the country, the attacks became more professional. And in your book, you describe an ambush of a Blackwater private security detachment by 12 insurgents in which the team was completely overmatched and only three out of the seven guys survived. Can you just talk us through that incident? As I think it's a perfect illustration of the violence that you could encounter. So what happened with that team was they um, they went out for a an airport pickup. Now, you know, the, the planes were coming in on a quite regular timing, so the insurgency knew when, when PMCs were going out to the airport and be coming back. The one advantage we had with Blackwater was that we had our own aircraft, you know, so the, the, the timings weren't that, you know, sort of scheduled. However, when I mean, they flew in, you could see them. So, okay, there's another plane coming in. So the boys drove out uh, along the Irish, and it was becoming very dangerous along the Irish at that time. Of, you know, there was more and more attacks. As they drove through the last of the three overpasses, which before you got to checkpoint one, the front vehicle was armoured vehicle. The back vehicle was a soft-skinned vehicle. Um, as they passed uh, under the last overpass, the insurgency was waiting for them there and hit them with an RPG right up the uh, the backside of the soft-skinned uh, suburban. Can, uh, killed everybody inside, as they would. It's a de- devastating, devastating weapon. Uh, the uh, front vehicle saw what, you know, the vehicle behind exploding, so they hit reverse and came back to provide a form of cover right next to them, not really knowing what had happened, but putting the armoured vehicle on the outside to do a crossover. The subsequent vehicle was just burst into flames, and it was just a roaring mess, so the guys got out. But as soon as they, they got out to sort of assess the situation, started getting attacked from behind, but then another vehicle drove past them and stopped about 100 metres up in front, and then... Uh, about seven guys, I believe, thereabouts, I'm not exactly sure, the number got out an extended line and started pepper potting, you know, do a fire and maneuver towards our guys. And that shows training. That shows a lot of training. That shows a lot of discipline. Our guys were returning fire, had to disengage from trying to help anybody who was in the car that had been hit. They were all dead anyway. And then that car was a blazing inferno. So another thing that our guys had, which I... I thought was a bad move was they had they had M4 Bushmasters, which are semi automatic M4s to a degree. I never liked them. Uh they tended to overheat. They were black. They overheat and uh they had a lot of jam, it's a lot of stoppages. But anyway, our guys were firing on the guys who were trying to get close to them to finish them off and then another vehicle pulled up to the side. On the, so there was three vehicles that all lined up and started to attack from the side. They uh then both of the Blackwater vehicles caught fire because I was shooting um Tracer. AP rounds into the engine, so they, they hit the fuel and a few oars and up it went. So they knew what they were doing with the weapons that they had. They had the right kind of rounds in the belt. They were using the right kind of machine gun to, to fire into the armoured vehicle. They were firing into the um, the windscreen and the engine, and, and no armoured vehicle glass is going to withstand that kind of treatment for too long. And it wasn't, wasn't for the fact that the guys were able to really just form as a cohesive team and they had a, a ton of HE um, grenades as well. And they were able to lob those down at the guys, which caused you know the, a lot of damage to the insurgents. Another way or reason you could tell that they were perhaps um, trained was they were taking their engine and dead away with them. Now, mm-hmm. normally the insurgency at that time didn't do that. They would shoot and scoot, you know, or shoot and you know, take off. These guys, they wanted a fight. They were sticking around for a fight. Unfortunately... Uh, only three of them survived, if I can remember correctly. One was not injured at all, two had, had wounds. Big military didn't come and help them, which was another problem that we faced when we were when we were there. And uh, they had to commandeer a vehicle on the other side of uh, Irish, Route Irish, to get back to the, the to the CPA, uh, which sort of leads on again now to the, the you know the the equipment. You know, we didn't have long long range comms. These guys were no more than 10 kilometers away from us, and they were getting killed. And we had 
we had no clue. And so there was, there was never any point for me at QRF because you could stand there, wait around your vehicles for a QRF, but no one had any ability to let you know that they were in trouble. And in that contact you're describing there, it was quite interesting that what sort of saved the, the remaining guys was a, the, the Polish yes. lad that did a, yeah. basically went for it, didn't he? Did. He did a charge as the enemy, essentially, didn't he? He did. When I was attached to, to the regiment in the UK, of training with the Polish Grom, and uh, he was former Grom. And those guys, hats off to them. They they were just fearsome. And uh, I worked with them in Kabbalah when I was I was doing the Timad PST. And uh, this guy just got up and just went for it. And he, he ran around throwing HE grenades and shooting them in the head as quick as he could. You know, yeah, he was he saved the day. Yeah, it's interesting. Just throughout your book, you're saying that uh, again. You know, when you're operating your vehicles, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Barry, but you may be operating two up in one vehicle. And you had a, a tail gunner in effect. Yes. You stick a guy in the boot with a belt-fed weapon and uh, grenades handy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the small guy got their job, and he was he was probably the most one of the most vital guys. He had the driver, who was obviously very very important, but the uh, trunk monkey was super important because you know there were there was videos of them driving up behind vehicles on tanker and just shooting them out of people who didn't have trunk monkeys. You know, and I had two fantastic guys who I'm still in contact with nowadays. You know, they were short, they were ugly. They saw everywhere we went, but nowhere where we were going. And, and that's a hell of it. To be facing backwards that whole time, it was, uh, and their job was super important. They did a really good job. Yeah, I, I, and all this sort of stuff I've seen on private military companies, that was the first time I'd heard about that. So it's, uh, I, was that a usual, an unusual practice? You... No, it's it's a, it's an American practice. Um the, the having a trunk monkey, it's uh, yeah, it's been proven over and over again that you know, you know your ring mirrors and your rear vision mirror are okay, but you know to turn around in a yeah. vehicle and try and shoot backwards is difficult. So if you've got someone dedicated in that position, it's it's very important. I mean, it's just like being on a, a World War Two bomber. The security, the uh, secret yes, service, they do. In America, does it? Yeah, they do it on their their convoys. Yes. So Barry, we've talked about some of the serious contacts involved, the training you've had to do, the poor quality of some of the guys. Again, reading your book, what struck me was the fact that you couldn't fire people, even though they were proven to be bad uh, operators. And, you know, actually during your operations, they had let you down. Can you just give, again, people sort of an overview of how you tried to get rid of these people and the, and the pushback you got from the bean counters, in effect, yeah. uh, who ran the company? Yeah, there was, and at the beginning, there wasn't that much of a problem. If someone wasn't up to scratch, you know, firing them, and then they'd, they'd leave, they'd, they'd leave the country. But um, as time went on, no, trying to fire somebody got quite difficult. All they'd want to do is, is palm them off to another team, palm them off to another city, palm them off to another CPA somewhere. So basically, there was a group of dregs going around, getting palmed off, you know, as to where we were would take them and we, we didn't have a say in it now because we were Blackwater commercial uh, we were in a state department contract we didn't have to have state clearances when I when I started doing one of the uh, contracts here in November and uh, the uh, IRI contract I also had a Scotsman I had some other non-American people finally in the company uh, another New Zealander clearances were required so that that palm them off to me I became the sort of trash can for these these uh, these douchebags, really, and um, mm -hmm. then if I wanted to fire them because they weren't, you know, performing up to my standard, it just fell on deaf ears a lot of the times because that guy that you're firing is one guy that can't be charged to a contract, you know. So that's that's money, and, and until they can find a replacement, you just got to work with this or have this guy work as much as you can, and, and it actually became a bit of a problem, big problem. You know, one of the contracts, in fact. And a guy like that can bring down the whole morale and discipline of the whole whole team, which is why as a as the team leader you've got to you've got to step up. And um, you know that was a really was probably the worst time for me too because I'd been in for over a year, and I was at that time starting to take you know show the effects of uh, drinking too much because of what I was doing, I suppose, and trying to hide or trying to cover up. And then dealing with these idiots, my, my, my patience and temper was getting shorter and shorter. And I was tired of be having drugs thrust upon me. And uh, also what was happening back then, also the uh, contracts were now going 
solely American personnel, which was a bit of a slap in the face for any of us who had been with them from the beginning. And now we're not good enough for you people, you know, for you guys. You only want Americans on it. So I kind of went, you know what, screw you, I'll go. So mm -hmm. yeah, getting rid of people was, was difficult because that was money that they the company wasn't getting. And uh, it, it just became one more pain that I didn't need. I think it's remarkable, though, that in the seven odd years that you worked in Iraq as a team leader, that you never lost anybody killed or seriously injured. Yeah. So your training and uh, despite the fact you had to deal with these guys uh, must have paid off in some respects. Yeah, it was, um, you know, and it's really good because I still have really good rapport with the guys that are in my that were in my team. Uh, we still communicate now. Um, fantastic guys, all of them. Uh, we, we've lost one guy since. Um, you can say his name because he's, he's dead bullfrog. He, but he fell off his Harley, so he died happy. <laughs> you know, and uh, one of my very good friends who um, who I got over, he wasn't with me, but he he, um, he shot himself. But he wasn't with my teams. But, you know, I think of him almost every day as well. You know, no, I was very lucky. I didn't lose anybody. And in order to redo anything that could be characterized as being illegal or stupid, um, which kind of leads on to how did Blackwater start getting into such a bad reputation? Before Kev puts that question to you, Barry, I'd just like to take an opportunity now to just ask you, is that you wrote in your book that you didn't have much time for British private security companies. Mm -hmm. Can you just expand on that for us, please? I don't really have a lot of time for officers. And... Um, I hope none of you. I hope none of you guys are officers. By the way, <laughs> oh, I, I'm insulted. You think I was an officer, Barry? <laughs> I work for a thing. You have that bearing, Colin. <laughs> I've got glasses on. That's what it is. I kind of found that the the, the the British registered PMCs, you know, were very military run. Like, yeah, I mean, they should be. And well, but there was also that definite officer class that was still running through them. You know, and and uh, when a lot of New Zealanders joined. A particular British company, but they found it very difficult to um, sort of have their suggestions heard or have their ideas taken seriously because they didn't come from an officer class. They didn't come from a certain regiment. They didn't come from a certain this. There was always that kind of, we still drink the pims and, and wear the red pants. The Americans are very open, very open. And, uh, you know, I was a New Zealander for crying out loud and one of the first in the company and they trusted me to be a team leader and they they listened to my suggestions and but it wasn't that way for for our guys in the, in the British company I mean and even later on I had to go and find some of them weapons and body armor because they, they, mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to carry automatic weapons and which was just ludicrous and, and maybe I'm just being a little bit general generalizing here but I, I find with the the British PMCs it's kind of always the cup is half empty rather than with the US the cup is half full and uh, Americans are I think that's a very British attitude, actually. It is, it is. I think, that's a, I think that's a cultural thing, I think. Yeah, and they carry it on into... So, so I think a lot of the, a lot of the historical companies always were oh, yeah. led by officers, weren't they? All formed by officers. Exactly. It, especially the British ones. Yes, yeah. And they carry that on into into the civvy street, for sure. I mean, they still they still wear their rank and yeah. stuff. Uh, we, we call it by rank, where in America, they're not. They're, they're very open and down to earth, I find, and very easy to work with, where... I had a little bit of difficulty mm. with, the, with the British ones. So during the time in uh, Iraq, Blackwater developed a, a poor reputation due to alleged acts, including the notorious Lizor Square incident on the 16th of September 2007, when employees of Blackwater shot at Iraqi civilians, killing 17, injuring 20. And you write in your book that you feel that Blackwater was scapegoat for that incident and also that the pardons for the contractors jail for their actions, you initially thought they were guilty and deserved their sentences, were justified. Can you outline to the listeners your thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, now, in 2007, when that, that incident happened, we, we had already gained, I suppose you could call it a, a bad reputation, but a lot of it was actually professional jealousy, I would like to think. By that stage, we had... All the guns, we had the helicopters, we had all the Gucci gear, maybe except for long-range comms, but this is the State Department I'm talking about, those guys. Yeah, and, and perhaps I think they they walked around with a bit of a swagger, which, and if, if anybody knows the security industry, it's, it's full of very insecure people. So when that incident happened, 
and anyone who knows Massa Square, I mean, we, we got into a shootout there ourselves. I mean, it was always being attacked. You had, you had the hotels were always being attacked right there. There was one guy that definitely went with killing on his mind uh, when that incident happened. But he wasn't any of the four who got locked up. We were getting blamed for everything that was that was going wrong. We were rolling too hard. We were doing this too wrong. We were doing that too wrong. Well. We, we heard everything. Also, after that incident, I mean, the Department of Justice didn't investigate that incident until three weeks after it happened. And, and I initially thought these guys were guilty. But then I, I listened to a podcast by uh, Sean Ryan, who's got a very good podcast show, and he interviewed the four guys. What they were saying was very viable. I mean, like I say, the, the, the Department of Justice didn't investigate until three weeks after the incident happened. The Iraqis were getting paid $10,000 per person who had allegedly got killed. So it's a lot of, yeah. And also, three weeks in a Baghdad, uh, the whole incident is completely different. There is no evidence of anything going on. So, you know, there was, no, there was really nothing to investigate. What the Department of Justice did was interrogate this one particular guy who basically told a story to, to cover his backside, blame, you know, everybody else but him. And then another thing too, which I, I firmly believe in, if the, the U.S. Department of Justice or any of those entities want to go after you, they will get you. There's mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it, you know, and then they will throw the book at you. Everybody didn't like Blackwater at that time, and the media were definitely against us. So everyone was jumping on the wagon, yeah, Blackwater are nothing but a bunch of killers, blah, blah, blah. I like to think that, well, I, I sort of realize, I, well, realize, I know that there was definitely professional jealousy amongst some of the other PMCs. The Department of Justice was looking for somebody to hang to make the left-leaning media and people in the U.S. Who, are, who, are, who, by the way, loved the fact that, yeah, you know, going to go and invade Iraq until it actually turned into a custard pie. And they go, oh, no, I wish we should never come here. That jump sides. So we need people to hang. And it was these four unfortunate guys. And they got horrendously bad sentences without a proper investigation. And, and it also, in my opinion, and I think I, I write it in the book, the real people who should have been investigated are the ones who started this. And they were in the White House. They were in 10 Downing Street. They went for they went for didn't work for Blackwater. I was quite interested to read how you had your change of mind there. So I was just... I really wanted you to outline your thoughts and why you you considered that. So that was it. That was interesting. Thanks okay, for that. Thank you. It's hard for people over in, in other countries to understand how confusing Iraq was. Yes. The confusion that was out there, the various factions that were were played in the same you know area, with influences from Iran and their pieces coming in. Mm. Obviously, we disbanded the Ba'ath Party. There was there was disgruntled ex-military there. Police were trying to choose a side, the winning side. Some days it's going to be the Allies or the Coalition. The next time it will be somebody else. Difficult place. Definitely, and that brought down to uh, American foreign policy, which has never been that great, never been that good. They knew how to start the war. They just had no idea what to do once it started or how to finish it. It yeah. could have been completely different. And you can say the same about Libya, Afghanistan. Well, I went, I went to Libya. <laughs> not as if we're learning. <laughs> we're not learning along the way, never are do. we? Never do. <laughs> You always hope to get it right one day. That's the that's the game. That's why you keep doing it. But the other thing, and this is for another podcast, I don't want to get down the rabbit hole on this one because I'll set both of you yeah. off, but you look at the money that was oh. being made in Iraq okay. from the likes of KBR and all the rest of it, but that, oh, yeah. that, is, a, yeah. that is a podcast on its own. Back in the day, it was called War Profiteering. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, East Indies Company, mate, that's what yeah, it was about. Exactly. Well, you know, We've been doing it forever. Yes. That's a great point. The East India Company was a PMC, or correct? Yeah, it was, yeah. absolutely. And, and, that, and that was that was obviously, yeah. you know, at the time of the American Revolution, we had our own private military yes, companies, right. defense contractors working for the crown, privateers. We used yeah. to call them pirates. Yeah. That we employed. Yeah, exactly right. British have been doing this for a long time, and we had companies all over the world doing exactly. it. We ran the opium trade. Yeah. You know, we we're not we're not. We we wrote, the, we wrote a rule book. <laughs> yeah, well, we did. We set the standard. We had private military companies yes. before most people had come. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And actually, I remember reading that the East India Company got so powerful. I did not the, the British government disband it in the end because they got so they worried to, about it. Well, it, it was it was probably as wealthy as the state was, as powerful. If you think about it, where it was operating from, 
It had its own fleet, its own armies, massive amount of wealth, yeah. and massive amounts of influence in parliaments and the governments. It was more powerful than KBR will ever be. In your book's conclusion, you ask the question, Iraq was the great security contractor experiment where owners of companies like Blackwater tried to showcase the viability of private operators alongside or in place of the military. So the question is, did it work? For Iraq, I believe it did. It did showcase that private security companies could work alongside and, and to a degree in front of the military. You're looking at a, a quantity of highly trained people in civilian street. So why not use their skills, right? You know, pay them what they're worth and they will do the job. But I think also in the, in the same token with the Iraq war, it showed you don't want to see what they're doing. Keep them in the dark. Civilians don't have the stomach for it. Private contractors can do static security, sure. They can do transport, blah, blah, blah. But they can also do the duty work, you know. And um, we don't need flag-draped coffins. We just need a steady paycheck and, and the job will get done. We don't have that. And I'm not saying that with, uh, private security contractors are a bunch of killers, but the rules of engagement aren't necessarily the same, you know, for us. And also, you know, look at all the black sites. They were run by private security companies. You know, they were, they were run by PMCs doing all the, all the bad duty stuff. No one knew anything about it. So, yeah, I believe it was. And, and you alluded to it in your, uh, a couple of sentences ago, Barry. The capitation cost of a private security company uh, operator is nothing. You know, if he loses his legs, yeah. the Veteran Affairs yeah. Committee doesn't have to pay out for any hospital treatment or give him a pension. Nobody actually knows how many private security contractors are killed no, right. in, in these uh, countries. So if you talk about the morality of it, there's a bit of hypocrisy, I think, feeds, feeds out from the government and, and civilians are happy to see private security company operators get killed without the sort of the asking, well, what is the real moral and financial issues that are, that are being covered? I disagree on the financial because to get a good PSC or PMC, the military have probably spent an enormous amount of money so when you look at you, Barry, to get you to the, to the place where you can then go into that private industry, the New Zealand Defence Force spent an enormous amount of money getting you to Tier 1. Yeah. So actually, when you start looking at it, and then the PMCs will then start drawing from the serving military. So in the during operation, you start off as a soldier, and then later on you go there as a pro. You leave the army thinking I'd get better money to do in this. Yeah, I, th I, actually, think, I think you take me up. I think you take me up a little bit wrong there, Kev. When I meant the financial side was, I meant that um, you can cut off a contractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. I get that. If he's injured or killed, there's yeah. no payouts. Yeah, yeah. You know, I but, that's but, what I meant. But you're right. The investment in somebody like Barry, that's your one soldier, is huge. Yeah, it's huge. And actually, downside to private security companies, especially in during operations, is they draw. A lot of your best service personnel where you need them the most because you've got today's war. What about tomorrow's war where there is no PMCs, no PSCs? Because it's a, it's an expeditionary warfare. We go there. We don't set up in the same way we do in enduring. Where are all your best soldiers? Soldiering has changed though, even in the last twenty years. It's not the same at all. Yeah, you know, in the next twenty years, it probably won't even be soldiers on the ground. You now they will be sitting behind computer screens. I mean, look at look, mm -hmm. look at Wagner um, or Wagner, whatever you want to call them. They're out there on the ground fighting because look at Russia. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of, um, no offense to sort of Russians, but they're kind of like 15, 20 years behind where it comes to sort of like their mindset and their tactics and their technology. You know, so their ground war, there won't be so many ground wars, I don't think, particularly for, for Western allies or the way that the military or the way the wars are going. But you're still going to have to have yeah. the security people finding information extracting information and uh, doing some things that are perhaps not nice. We we'll still have tier one, obviously, yes, but it gives us who have been tier one something to retire to, something to do once we get out and, and, and not go mental and put a, you know, a pistol in our mouths. That's a, a good lead in to my next question then, Barry. And uh, throughout this podcast series, we've talked to quite a few veterans. Nobody deploys on operations, whether they're a soldier or a private military contractor without paying a price. And there is a price to pay. You might not realise it at the time, but there's always a price in these sort of situations. So what effect did working in Iraq have on you personally? Uh, mental. I got diagnosed with PTSD. Alcohol. Became, I became dependent on alcohol to the point where it was... I was getting pretty reckless. You know, I'd be going out 
sort of looking for trouble. It was keeping my demons down from, from what I'd seen and, and things that I'd been through. When I left, you know, I had nightmares. My wife attests to that. I've had plenty of those. And I don't trust government at all. I don't like being around peoples. I live isolated up on a hill. I try to limit my my human contact or contact with humans, you know, to very little if I can help it. I'm much better now. I've, I've stopped drinking. I still don't particularly like people. And my dreams come and go. And, and this is a little bit of a side mm-hmm. note for for writing this book. When I first started, I thought this would be quite cathartic and I'd be able to handle, you know, some of my demons and write them down and all that sort of carry on. And I thought, yeah, okay, this is working. But then as the writing process went on, and I did first draft, second draft, right up to like fifth and sixth draft, and I'm rereading everything all over again, it's, it's started to kick me off again. So, um, you know, I would, I'd be writing and, and I, I would tear up and cry at certain certain parts and have to push the, the laptop away. And every time I read it, then, then I, I would have to stop, gather my thoughts again and, and sort of like try not to reflect on it too much. Resist the urge to go on YouTube and, and see the guys getting killed all over again. Uh, you know, things like that. So... Yeah, there is a definite, there's a definite toll and there's a definite price, you know, and, and you know, I just, if you don't mind me just mentioning, you know, one other thing, I mean, the way they try and appease themselves in the military, I suppose, is, is medals, you know, here's a medal, here's some sort of prize, you know, and, mm-hmm. and again, private security companies, you know, contractors, we don't get medals and whatever, but we all suffer the same, exactly the same as the military. I think our medal or my medal uh, for me was, okay, I've bought a house. I own it completely. Mm-hmm. I, I own everything. I own, own nothing because I earned enough money to be able to do that. You know, my, my four brothers in the military who are still on very terrible wages, they have their medals, they have their VAs and whatever else, but they, they still suffer hugely, you know? I'll, I'll make a comment on your book. I don't know if if it will surprise you or you, you you expect it. So when I read your book, your book reads like a thriller in a lot of places. Uh, and in the occasional chapters, you'll throw up a glimpse of your humanity. And one of them was uh, the kid in the building site who was eating the dead pigeon. Yeah. And, the, and the building site, which you thought was just a collapsed building, was actually his home and his family was still buried under it. And you write quite emotionally about that. A lot of time I do feel during that, that those chapters, you were sort of hiding your true feelings though you did give these little glimpses and you talked about the alcohol issues and and and, and some of your feelings at the point but you're i won't spoil it for people but your last chapter i think your humanity really comes out mm-hmm. and i'm trying not hard to spoil the book for people here but that sort of description i've gave do you think that's a fair reading of what you what your book was yeah for sure yeah that poor kid's with me every day sort of thinking about it and uh you know, it, it affected how I treated my children, you know, when back then, because I, I didn't have the tolerance for their everyday normal, you know, 10, 11 year old selves doing what 10, 11 year olds do. And, um, you know, I've learned since to apologize and deal with that and we get on fine, but I still think about that kid every day. I, I, you know, you know, I'm going to say, I hope he ended up all right, but I think there's a very good chance he's, he's mm-hmm. dead. Yeah, and, and just the stupidity of it. And then I deal with or try to to think about what my role in this whole thing was and um, did I play a part in a bad part of this? And, you know, well, I did. You know, if you're going to be honest about it. Uh, but would I change it? No, I, I wouldn't. It's It's got me to where I am today and, and made me the sort of person I am today. But it's, it's kind of one of those catch-22s that you, I think everyone who joins the military does when they join the military. They don't really realize what they're getting into. Yeah, we're all together. We're going to go overseas. We're going to do this, do this. But when you do it, it's the afterwards. And, then, and that's where your troubles start. That's where your problems start. Yeah. It's not when, when the bar's closed and everyone's moved on and you're married. And then you're sitting there in, in your dark room in the basement or whatever, you know, in the cold sweats. That's that's when you 
that's when your troubles really start. And that's what military, that's the, other, that's the side they don't really tell you about. It's a lot better now, but it's, uh, that's, that's the worst part of it. Yeah, the, the, the tool is absolutely still there. And uh, so we had a good chat about your book there, Barry. Where can listeners buy your book? Where's the best place for them to get it? You can buy it online. Uh, the publishing company, which I'm very grateful for, for publishing the book, uh, Biteback, uh, you can go on their website. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. And uh, Barnes & Noble, I believe, have it. It's, it came out in the UK uh, on the 20th of July. It's coming out in Australia and New Zealand uh, this month, end of the, yeah, later on in this month, and then in the US uh, a little bit after that. So you can get it online uh, at the moment, all bookstores in the UK. So Barry, what are your thoughts then on an advice to anyone consider the move to the in, to the security industry and work in hostile environments? My, I mean, go for it. You know, why not? That's what you've been trained to do, and, and you've got to make a living when you get out of it. Mm. Make sure you're prepared and you are sufficiently trained for it, however. Uh, don't expect it to be, you know, limousines and, and three-piece suits and walking on red carpets. It's generally hostile. To rely on your training. Rely on yourself. Rely on your teammates. Uh, don't do anything that's going to keep you awake at night uh, and years down the road. Don't take anything you're not prepared to leave behind in a hurry. Don't put anything on social media either because... Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think there's a number of people serving and not serving that should... Yeah. Any, yeah of that leave it, sort of advice. Leave it alone. Be the, you've already said it, be the great be man. The great, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that'd be about it. It's soldiering, just not in uniform. Exactly. I mean, it's the same sort of preparation, mental, mental preparation for where you're going. Make sure if they got homes in, in order so you don't have that haunting you. When you're overseas, you can't do nothing about it, the thing you forgot to sort out. But also, I mean, as you read in the book, we all had our five-year plan, which all got pushed to six, seven, eight. If you have a five-year plan, try and stick to it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and not many do, yeah. Barry. Yeah, not many do. Uh, take, it, take it from someone who kept screwing theirs up. As usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dates, which is the guest choice of book film and luxury item so Barry for this episode what's your favourite book my favourite book is uh, Shantaram I, I allude to a, uh, a passage in, in the beginning of my book about forgiveness um, it's by uh, Gregory David Roberts an Australian guy and it's a fantastic story um, it really changed my life actually and that, that's the book you refer to when I, when I was talking about how I felt you opened up in your final chapter of your book the first sort of paragraph, if I remember rightly, starts off with you saying you discovered this book and the effect it had on you. So it's had a, it's genuinely had a transformative effect on you. It has indeed. Yeah, it has, and I, I recommend it to everybody. Um, I was I was drinking quite badly. I'd been kicked out of home. I was in Africa. Didn't take it seriously, you know, as you never you never do until it till it happens. And then um, I was in Kenya in uh, in a suburb called Karen. And I found the book in the back of a cupboard. You know, it sounds like, but it sounds like another story. I read it and I couldn't put it down. Then, just by reading how this guy wrote and the characters that he wrote about, really struck me. And and, and it became the message that it sent to me, that it gave to me, basically what happened to him. He'd got himself in a poo, mm -hmm. poo sandwich, and he'd run away from it. But life, weirdly, gave him an opportunity to get himself out. And he was bright enough to see it and even brighter enough to take it. Mm. So I was in the exact same situation, basically. And so I I did that. And uh, it got to the point where I was I, I didn't want to read it anymore because I was going to finish it. you know. And uh, so that would be my book on the island. And your film choice? Sexy Beast. Oh, my. <laughs> Sexy Beast. You're not taking a pair of those trunks to that island, are you, that Rafe Winston wears at the start, Barry? Uh, and, and a bag of mice. <laughs> <laughs> that movie is like, yeah, I, I just, I, I can't watch movies with guns, right? I can't watch military movies. I can't watch anything like my wife always kicks me out of the room because I'm, I, guns don't do that or whatever. But um, that movie was just like, I did not expect Ben Kingsley to be like that at all. And I've always been a Rafe Winston fan. Oh, a psychotic, oh, isn't he? It's fantastic. No, nah, that's, that's my movie. I, I love that movie. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. It's a great film. 
And what's your luxury item? A cookery. Cookery knife. The Nepalese knife by probably the best survival knife I think I've ever had. Uh, and I use them in the unit. I use, I use one in the unit for the whole time I was there. You can do anything you want with it. So that would be my, my luxury item because you're on a deserted island. So you got to take something that's a bit more sensible for survival. Hmm. I've never had that one before as well. So you've picked three originals there, Barry. So thanks no, for that, mate. Colin, your book? My book choice is Barry's book. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about it. And uh, as I say, it's like it's written by two people in some respects. And uh, you've got to go through the first part, which is written like a thriller. And Barry might, might hate me for saying this, occasional glimpses of humanity. And I don't mean you're not a human person, Barry, yeah. but it, I did feel you were sort of just keeping your real self behind that thriller-style writing. And then at the end, it did take me by surprise, that final chapter where you sort of opened up and talk about that book, the change it had on yeah. you. And I think if you read it, MD reading to I'd say to them, there's going to be two responses to it. The first response is, I think if a young person reads it, he will think, that is the life for me. An older person, like an old fart like me reading it, thinks, Jesus Christ, can't believe companies sent people out so under-equipped and all the rest of it. And uh, it's only like yourself, Barry, with your background in soldiering that turned it round and made it safe for you and your guys. So it's a book of a couple of parts and... Uh, yeah, I'll leave people to make up the mind about it. Thank you. My book, Carly, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> no, why are we <laughs> here, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why, 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 he loves the limelight, Barry. <laughs> I, just, I, I just thought I'd you know, throw that in. It's, the, it's called The Greatest Raid on St. Nazare, 1942, The Heroic Story of Operation Chariot. There was a film out that was uh, very similar. It wasn't exactly the same story. And it was about 612 men, Marines and Navy, who conducted a raid in a German uh, submarine pen using HMS Campbelltown as a uh, basically a floating bomb. It's proper boys' own stuff during the, during the, the law in, in 1942, the Second World War. We'd gone through Dunkirk. And this is where, as part of Churchill's uh, desire, set Europe ablaze, doing these raids. And this is one of those raids that was probably deemed the greatest raid of the Second World War. They rammed the submarine pen. The commandos got off, started fighting amongst all the Germans, finding time for the destroyer to explode. And at the end, there was 89 members of the raiding party out of 612 were awarded Gantry medals including five VCs Amazing. unfortunately only 228 returned to Britain 169 were killed on the operation and 215 became casualties sorry POWs daring suicide or you know <laughs> when you start looking at it whoever made the plans how they got that across the board to everyone else to say I need a flotilla of ships Royal Marines, and want to fill that ship full of explosives, and under fire, we're going to go and ram the German submarine pens. But I mean, they just got on with it, and I mean, this was the army commandos at the time as well. They just got on with it, and they smashed it. They did a, an unbelievable thing. Oh, okay, mate, cool. thanks for that one. So we're going to wrap up now. So that's it for another episode. And Barry, thanks, mate, for coming on. That was a really thank interesting you. chat. Thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you, Kevin. No, thank you. And also thanks to Lister for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming. And our email and social media links are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you download us from iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get your podcast from. And thanks again to Nick Beale for his continued support and sponsorship to the series and offering technical help for his company, ISA. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier. Mm-hmm.